you can do thousand or five hundred. Who is coming? Who is coming? My neighbor. You know, we'll not be joking when it comes to giving. If you don't want to give, just go home. I really believe that if Jesus was physically on the earth today, he wouldn't be riding the donkey. All you hear is how to build the flesh. It's a feel good message. And I'm sorry to say that prosperity has gone a little crazy. The pulpit, the pit that we are pulled into. The stage, the cameras, the crowd, and the superstar. Bathed in a brilliant cascade of lights. Cameras ready for action, and the crowds roaring in the anticipation palpable in the air. And would you believe me if I told you that this is not a concert? but a church service. And that this man is not a minister, but a minister. And the crowd, those are supposed to have been disciples, but now they just follow us. See? These are the centuries. The larger the capacity, the more successful the preacher is. And these are the private homes, mansions, luxurious mansions. These are the rights. And these, these are the bodyguards. They are charismatic. They are lavish. They are opulent. They are extravagant, even prodigal. They are every word that spells R-I-C-H. But they were not always like that. They started from the bottom. Humble. Poor in spirit. Poor in the pocket. But with a calling. Until they discovered the prosperity gospel. Or was it thrust upon them by the circumstances? Was it a way of getting out of poverty for them? Or did they consciously plan to make a way of collecting money from the masses? Because now they use these pulpits to pull us to the pits. This is Jeff Kafka. Welcome to the Financial Crimes Podcast. The allure of prosperity gospel, well, outwardly promising spiritual fulfillment and material abundance through faith conceals a disconcerning reality. Operating as a manipulative scheme, prosperity gospel scams exploit the vulnerabilities of seekers, weaving a web of false promises and distorted interpretations of faith to extract money from you. Through charismatic preaching and selective scriptural references, these scams capitalize on the aspirations of you, the follower, ultimately enriching 
the pastors of the deception who are leaving you and I, the honest seekers, disillusioned and financially depleted <laughs> or poor. But the views expressed here are mine. Any resemblance to what made them contrary is purely coincidental. So sit back and enjoy this mini documentary. But it would be awesome if you hit that subscribe button. Thank you. You are awesome. Each magnum opus inevitably begets a paltry imitation. Or, in simpler terms, every masterpiece has a cheap copy. Nike Samsung The Church and even Christ. Today, I want us to objectively dissect the lie in belief, the ills in the illusion of religion. I want us to discuss how some churches have become multi-million business empires by misrepresenting the gospel. In the gospel of Christ, God is love. But in the gospel of prosperity, God is terrible. He keeps scores on who to bless and who not to bless according to how much you give or do not give to the pastor. In the Gospel of Christ, Jesus feeds crowds of 4,000, another time he feeds a crowd of 5,000, but in the Prosperity Gospel, it is one man being fed by the 5,000. Not just once, but over and over and over. I do not claim to be holier than thou, because granted, I have been a member of a mega church before, and I have cast seeds of faith on the furrowed crowns of the elders, expecting a payback in form of a financial blessing. And in no way am I saying that your pastor is a prosperity preacher. All I'm saying is that we've heard of them, we know them, they're out there, so hear me out, as this is just my opinion. And critics, you are most welcome. But I still insist that the best business to start today would be a church. The business model of a prosperity church follows that of most successful businesses. Subscription businesses. Retention, continuous engagement and scalability. Look at Netflix. Millions of monthly subscribers. Safaricom. Millions of daily subscribers. Even drug dealers follow this model. They have trusted addicts who consume the product daily. And then there is the prosperity charge. The opportunity for daily and weekly subscribers. Because every Sunday, church members pay. I could cunningly say that they're paying for their sins, but no, I won't say that. But nonetheless, they pay money to the church in form of offerings, uh, they pay tithes, they pay uh, Thanksgiving money, they pay sacrifices money, they pay fast fruits in form of money. No, you get your first salary, you take it all to the church, they pay dedication, if you buy a car, you bring it to be dedicated and you have to give an envelope uh, beside that. Uh, they pay for firstborn something, uh, they pay for outreach, they pay for projects for the church, they pay for countless other reasons. Please let's uh, package our worship seed if you've not done so. Um, please be reminded we can uh, pay that by cash or check, check or through the electronic giving channels 
the information is as display on the screen. And what's good about this business model is that it's registered under society in Kenya and it's exempted from paying taxes. All the pastor has to do is pay the pastors, assistant pastors, pay the choir, pay the ashes. That is if they are on a payroll. If they are volunteers, the better for him. On the other hand, a prosperity church owner also owns the businesses built by the church. In other words, the money that you bring is used as capital to start businesses that are now personally owned by the preacher. The ownership model is unlike any of other businesses. Normally, if I contribute capital towards a business, I expect a partnership agreement or at least a share certificate, you know? Because this not only gives me ownership rights, but also guarantees me a share of the profits in future. But in church, members contribute and pledge monies for commercial projects such as schools, hospitals, hotels, real estate, tattoo business, whatever kind of business, and instead of a shared certificate on their contributions, they get a God bless you. And they go home to wait for our blessings, which may or may never come. Just go home. But is there a way to prove that churches really make money? If you go to the websites of these major churches, uh, we might find some financial statements of them. And what have we got here? This is the 2020 statements, uh, financial statements for Mavuno Church. And this is the 2022 financial statements for Seton. So I'm just going to use these statements to illustrate how much money can be made in churches where their primary source is faithful giving members. In no way am I suggesting that either Mavuno or Seton uh, is a prosperity church. No, I'm just using the statements for examples. Mavuno literally means harvest. I suppose it's harvest for the souls for God's kingdom, you know? But if looking at these figures, <laughs> it could be harvest of the souls plus what is in their pockets. In the year 2020, the COVID year, Mavuno Church made 201 million shillings from tithes and offerings alone. 201. And 21 more million shillings from other sources. These were donations. And surprisingly, these um, classes that they have for discipleship, new believers who want to start church there, they're taught some things, they think they pay some money. And those who want to get married and they go for those marriage counseling, and also teens and kids when they go for those camps. That's part of what contributed to the 21 million shillings. Add that to the fact that the church has also borrowed from financial institutions over 118 million shillings and has an asset base of half a billion shillings. Its land, its properties, its church equipment, the tent, everything, total to over 500 million shillings. I mean, that's not an empire. I don't know what it is. It's, however, a good thing that almost 100 million shillings goes back to the people, that is, the people who work directly at the church through staff payments. I must mean that those people are paid well. What is a bit of bingos is the other 100 million that is described as ministry direct expenses and ministry support expenses. It's just a general categorization, meaning it could be anything from paying light bills for the churches, uh, to telephone expenses, to water, to sponsoring lavish trips or buying the pastor a private jet. It could be anything. It could also be the amounts spent on what we'd expect churches to spend on, you know? feeding the orphans, 
you know, feeding the widows, helping the needy, uh, helping the homeless, impacting the lives of the 5,000 or so churchgoers, you know, physically, not just spiritually. And that being a COVID year, that is 2020 when this report was made, you'd expect that the church played a big role in alleviating the sufferings of especially its members. And you'd expect one large expense here, COVID response expenses. No, 20 million. But no. Instead, it bemoaned the decline in revenue like all other businesses did. The local shutdown led to closure of churches and an introduction of online services resulting in a drop in giving and other ministry revenues. Hmm. Okay. But if you thought Mavuno was making money, <laughs> wait until you see the 2022 reports for Satan. Titan offerings, 1.9 billion shillings. Other incomes, 132 million shillings. Wow. First of all, there's only a few hundred Kenyan companies with an annual turnover of 1 billion shillings, leave alone 2 billion. Meaning that this church is already in the blue chip category of businesses. The church has also invested in about 28 income generating projects. The Sitem schools, no, they're all over the country. Then the Sitem schools transport system is a separate business that generates income. Sitem catering, Sitem resorts, uh, their own Hope FM, radio and TV stations. There's even Sitem USA and Sitem Romania. In 2022, according to these reports, the investments collectively erecting 750 million shillings. After expenses, the net was about 33 million shillings. Now, to ask a question I had asked earlier, wouldn't it make more sense if the real funders of this project, that is you, the congregant or the faithful giver, were allowed to get a return on these investments. But to whom can we really ask these questions? Because indeed, if we asked Satan, we'd be told that Christ is the answer. Get it? The abbreviations? No? Okay. These are just two examples that prove the point that there is money to be made from faithful giving. It's up to you as a pastor, if you chose to go this way of looking for money from the flock to know, know how you'll clean your message, know how you will attract uh, masses of people to drunk to your church or your sanctuary. And that's why every day we wake up to these kind of messages. Pastors asking members to send money for prayers. And I heard no, who is coming? Why never? Who is coming? Why never? Just a thousand. Pastors selling items like handkerchiefs, uh, books they've written, DVDs of the preachings, anointing oil, which is usually olive oil or just normal cooking oil repackaged in a bottle, but rebranded with the pastor's face. Pastors staging miracles in order to attract more followers and grow their subscription base. But at what cost? Man? The aftermath is an ignorant and fleeced congregation still hanging by the straps of their boots waiting for a breakthrough. I mean, these are our fathers and mothers washing the streets in broad daylight for the prophet to drive through. Brainwashed men and women who go to such extremes that the consequences are irreversible. I mean, our kin, our brothers, our sisters, 
fasting to their death in Shakahola. 21 bodies have so far been found on land owned by a pastor in Kenya who was arrested for telling his followers to fast to death. Police said more shallow graves have yet to be dug up on the land belonging to Pastor Paul McKenzie. But, as I said, for every faith is an original. So I will let those who shepherd the soul reprimand those that have led the ship astray. You let me throw a challenge right now. I throw a challenge to all the pastors that we should agree together. In fact, if the government can coordinate it, it's good. We should, they should call off us pastors in Kenya and say we should stop collecting tithe and offering for only three months. No, for six months. That all of us preachers in Kenya should stop collecting tithe and offering for six months and see if the churches will continue. Any church that dies is not of God. Because without tithe and offering, a church that is of God can see go forward. And look at what they will say to us. Pastor, if you have a business, close it down because it's supposed to be full time. We're talking about regulation. Let me give you some how to regulate us. That is how to regulate us. So tell us that all the pastors who are doing business, the Bible says we should be full time and full length. So we should close all our businesses. Schools, close. Hospital, close. Shop, close. Real estate, close. Wherever you are working in government, sack. They should sack all of us who are pastors and now say focus on church. That is first regulation. Regulation, regulation number two, tell us to stop collecting tithe and offering for only six months. Because things are hard in Kenya. Just tell us like that. All of us, group us together and say, pastors, please stop collecting tithe because it is in the Bible. Elijah had no members. God fed him. He had no members. God commanded the ravens to feed him. So any church that will still continue when they don't collect tithe and offering for six months is of God. Because look at how God finances work. When you preach the gospel, it will impact the heart of people. And God will touch the heart to bring the money to you. Are you understanding me? So if you want to really, really regulate, those are the two insights. That is how to regulate. You. If, you, if you remove money from the church, the first churches die a natural death. They just remove money. Remove the image of jealousy in the house of a jealous God. Remove money and see. That is how you will know those who are really called of God. Try it and see how pastors will not commit suicide. In fact, they will, they, they will start a riot. They will say you are attacking the church in Kenya. Why the church in Kenya is going through a rebirth. So it's a challenge I have thrown. All of us preachers should stop collecting tithe and offering. In fact, if they can do it the whole world, you and should gather all the pastors in the world. Stop collecting tithe and offering for at least six months. Let's see if your church will, will survive. That's when the thieves will be exposed. <laughs>